I wanted to start the talk by emphasizing how big a deal uh, f the fruit and vegetable market is in Asia. A lot of people uh, have the vision of it as being a culture, a food culture that does incorporate a lot of fruits and vegetables, but the huge volume of it that it represents is quite stunning. And it's not only in a few countries or in urban and rural areas, but really spread between rural and urban areas. So this is data from very detailed household surveys of consumption showing that uh, the share in total food budget of both produced, produced, let's say farm output plus expenditures, purchased output, is about 14 to 16 percent over all these areas, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nepal, the poorest, urban and rural Vietnam. So the share is about 14 to 16 percent in both urban and rural areas. And if you look at this, you can compare the Asian figure I just noted with the figure for the United States uh, in the 2000s, which was about the same. So the share of consumption of fruit and vegetables is about the same in the two economies. Of course, one big difference is that the Asian economy is growing enormously faster in terms of the produce market than the United States and Europe. If you look at the share of the population in cities in 1950, it was indeed only about 18 percent. This had risen to 44 percent by 2010 and is projected to be 56 percent by 2030. That means that you go from having an urban population of, of only 500 million in 1970 to an urban population of 2 billion people by today, which is you know, a gigantic fruit and vegetable market. And very interestingly, again, a lot of exporters or people that might are thinking about foreign direct investment are thinking that people are basically poor and the middle class is not a very important share of the market. But in fact, the middle class, defined, let's say, roughly by the share of people that would be interested in buying imported fruit and vegetables, uh, is roughly 600 million people. So that's the size of the middle class if you combine Europe and the US together. Okay, so this is a huge market and this will grow, uh, the urban area will grow to 3 billion people in 2035. If it's like 40% is middle class by then, it would be something like 1.2 billion people in the middle class available as a market by 2035. So this is a gigantic market, far, far bigger than the US or Europe, uh, especially for fruits and vegetables, because this is what people are buying. If you're talking about luxury cars, it's also a big market, but smaller than US and Europe. And very interestingly, because the incomes are higher in urban areas than in rural areas, the share of the urban market in the total food market, and especially the total produce market, is much higher than even the share of urban areas in overall population, simply because urban incomes are higher. So in this case, urban markets are already the majority of national produce markets in Asia. If you think about this as a specific example, if you're a mango grower in Indonesia, 75% of your mangoes are going to cities. If you're a mango grower in Hainan in China, for whatever you're not exporting, probably 70% or 65% of your mangoes are going to cities. So already this is a major market and, as you'll see, a contested market. This market is growing extremely fast. If you think about the United States GDP uh, last year grew at about 1%. You compare that to a really bad year for China that was 8%. A horrible year for India that was 7%. So these economies are growing seven times, eight times faster than the US economy and because they're in a period of expanding share of fruit and vegetables in total expenditure, that market might be growing 10 or 15 times faster than the US and the European market. 
if you look at just rural urban supply chains going to, let's say, the urban market in Southeast Asia, it's expanded by a factor of 1,000% in the past 15 years, 20 years. And so a lot of this growth has been extremely sudden, not gradual, because urbanization has gone up, incomes have gone up, shipments of, of fruit and vegetables have become easier, and so the market has grown extremely fast in a very short time. Another thing that's interesting about this market is that if you went to, let's say, uh, China 20 years ago or Indonesia 20 years ago, you might find a relatively small set of products that were consumed all the time. You know, you might have pears, oranges, maybe apples at that time. You'd have a few kinds of vegetables. What's happened over the past 15, 20 years in both South Asia, India, China, Thailand, Indonesia, is an extremely fast diversification of fruits and vegetables. A lot of it into a lot of interest in imported fruits and vegetables. So when I first went, I, I lived um, four years in Delhi, in India, uh, recently, and then I lived three years in China, and then I lived uh, one year in Burma, and I just came back to the US. And so I saw a huge amount of change in a very, very short time. And one of the things that when I went to Beijing in 2003, uh, basically there was almost no Thai fruit, for example, durians, etc. in the market. Uh, there was local fruit. Um, very few U.S. apples. There was basically an absence of avocados and blueberries. I even talked about avocados and blueberries. I'm from California and, uh, and, and, and I'm also living in Michigan. So those are my two uh, fruits and fruits. And they said that uh, they never heard of it. They didn't think there'd be a market for it. Nowadays you see a lot of avocados in the China market, a lot of blueberries and also then Philippine bananas coming in, kiwi juice. Kiwi was just considered a niche product, and now you see a massive uh, consumption of kiwi juice. So, this, so the fruits and vegetables that are being consumed in China and in other countries in the region is changing extremely fast. And I think you can put this down to the fact that Asian consumers in general love to diversify their produce consumption. Uh, they're very open, I would say, more open even than U.S. Uh, consumers in terms of being flexible and changeable and open to new kinds of fruits and vegetables. And of course, this is not painting over the fact that there's different segments of consumers. You definitely have a set of poor consumers still uh, that are just focused on cost and you're not going to make much money out of that market. On the other hand, you have a transitional lower middle class where cost is still an issue, but now they're starting to buy massive amount of diversified kinds of fruits and vegetables. And then, of course, this middle class that I said is 600 million now, in a couple dec decades, more than a billion, is an extreme demand for quality, diversity, and more and more safety. The three years that I lived in Beijing, I remember that I would go to Chao Shifa to a supermarket there and buy my fruits and vegetables. And always in the back of my mind, I'd be wondering, are these Gonna, is, this, is this gonna be the week I'll buy and it'll kill me? You know, because there's a lot of toxins. It's like US a couple of decades ago in terms of food safety. And so there's a huge demand for more safe and quality fruits and vegetables in the market and the middle class wants that. Now, besides this huge change in demand and really very rapid change in demand, there's also rapid transformation of supply chains in Asia. Uh, and the thing that really hit me here is that if you have an urban market that's building six to ten times, 600 to a thousand percent in just a couple decades, you're going to have a big supply chain challenge. And obviously it's being met because the consumption is going up, but there's a lot of challenges still in the future. And the supply chain transformation that's occurred to meet the demands has not been gradual, but rather very sudden. In fact, that's something that has struck me in my eight years living in Asia directly, is that people would say, oh, the Asian system is very different from the US situation. Uh, you know, we, we don't have supermarkets as much as you do, and um, the US is used to supermarkets, and we're, ch we're changing, but we're changing slowly. 
And I'd say, no, what I've noticed in my almost decade in Asia is that the same kind of changes that occurred in the US in terms of supply chain transformation or shift to supermarkets is, is happening in Asia. It's just happening far, far faster than the US. That's the main difference. It's not the type of change, it's the speed of change. Okay? And of course, you're having growing pains. So the best example of that kind of rapid transformation is the supermarket revolution that I've written a lot about and studied in Asia and Latin America. This is happening extremely fast with the spread of supermarkets in Asia and Latin America, far faster than the US supermarket spread. If you think about Brazil as an example, Brazil's supermarket sector grew, did in 10 years what the United States supermarket sector did in 50 years. So same kind of growth, just five times faster. And China is twice as fast as Brazil in terms of the change. So these are abrupt, extremely rapid changes, and they're occurring three to five times faster than that already very fast income growth rate. India is one of the fastest growing supermarket sectors in the world. China, Indonesia. And so most of the produce is still as in the United States in my mother's time, or even in the 1950s, 1960s when I was a boy, there was no supermarket in Southern California where I lived. All the fruit and vegetables were going through wet markets and small shops. This is still going to be the case in Asia for the next 10 or 20 years. But the supermarket takeover of produce markets in Asia is happening far faster than it's happening in the US. I remember saying, well, it's, you know, if I go to the Beijing supermarkets, about, this is about seven-year-old information, 40% of the fruit retail in Beijing is going through supermarkets, 20% of vegetable retail, okay? And so I said, this is still partial. And then somebody, an old guy, now I'm an old guy, but an old guy that was working in supermarkets in the U.S. said, in the first 40 years of supermarket development in the United States, you barely had fruit and vegetable sales because my mother's generation, they were all used to going to shop at this mom and pops or the hawker or the small shop or the wet market. So the big difference in Asia is not what is happening, but how fast it's happening. That's the crucial point. And really, if you look at Beijing, it's very similar, exactly similar to France in the 1970s, 1980s, and to the US in the 1960s, 1970s, and to Hong Kong in the 1990s. So there's a rapid convergence process. And also, even within supermarket sales, you have a very fast change. Uh, I could take Thailand and Mexico. To me, Mexico and China have extremely similar trajectories. Um, really, the share of produce in supermarket sales as recently as 2000 was near zero. And now it's about 12, 15%, something that might be similar to what you'd find in Europe or the US. So, this has been a sudden recent change, um, and it's become a big focus of retail competition uh, to be able to gain these lower middle class and especially the middle class consumers that are really focused on quality and safety and diversity of the products. Now, the good news if you're an exporter is that Asian supermarkets tend to be much more focused, although this is not the majority of their vegetables, but sometimes in places like Indonesia, it's the majority of their fruit. That's not the case in China. It's still a minority of fruit is imports. But supermarkets in Asia are really the important driving force and motor for imports of fruit and vegetables being sold in the Asian markets. Okay? And they're doing that. They're using imports and their ability to buy imports in bulk and then market them well to gain competitive advantage over their enemies, which are the traditional wet markets. Okay, so uh, they're also uh, interested in imports for consistency and quality for the middle class. In, very interesting, I, I lived and worked quite a bit in Indonesia and found that 70% of the fruit in Indonesian supermarkets is from imports, mainly from Thailand and China. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And, the idea was is that you can get the quality and the price from Thailand and China, and so that competes with the local Indonesian fruit and vegetables, which are extremely good, but 
not marketed well and not as good in terms of uh, safety and consistency. So you have a lot of penetration of Asian exports of fruit and vegetables into Asian supermarkets beside U.S. fruit and vegetables, especially fruit, going into Asian markets. Another thing that's changed besides the penetration of supermarkets themselves has been the modernization of procurement systems. There's really been an intense pressure uh, combining, uh, to combine quality and then reduction of logistics costs and seasonality. I remember being in a supermarket chain in Beijing a, little, a couple years ago and the guy was cutting a lot of his distributors and trying to modernize his operation for acquisition of fruits and vegetables and other products. And I said, why are you doing this so fast? This is, you know, jumping ahead. And he said, let me tell you. We walked over to a window, he opens the window, looks down the street and he says, what do you see down there through the smog? There's Walmart, okay? Walmart growing quickly, so I have to equal the uh, technological changes and the procurement system changes of Walmart in order to stay in business. Now let's go to the other window, open that up, look down the street, and you find a no mao shi chang, you know, you find a wet market down the street, and they're not paying taxes, they're getting fresh produce every day, I have to compete with them. So to grow my share, the share that you saw has grown, they have to compete both with, let's say, modern European and U.S. Uh, supermarkets with their procurement systems as well as the traditional system. So this is really pushing them to quickly shift toward distribution centers um, and also national, regional, and global network sourcing, which they're using more and more in Asia. For example, Dairy Farm International in Southeast Asia is using regional and global sourcing, bringing in a lot of citrus, for example, from South Africa. Metro in China is also doing that with the global sourcing as well as regional sourcing for its operations. Matahari in Indonesia, which I'll come back to in a second. However, of course, the, these supermarket chains are still basically relying on spot and wholesale markets, but where they can, they're shifting toward direct purchase, and this is happening faster and faster. For example, Beijing supermarket chains buying directly from Dole Philippines for their banana and their pineapple uh, their uh, supply. They're also shifting, very importantly, to traditional, from traditional wholesale markets to specialized, dedicated wholesale logistics companies, exactly as you saw in the U.S., but they're just doing it very, very fast. I think that's even a, an opportunity for foreign companies. Uh, they're putting into place private quality standards, especially for their regional and their global sourcing operations. <sighs> In the middle of this, you have a lot of emergence of midstream services in wholesale, transport, cold storage, and packing, which I think is also a giant business opportunity in Asia. Besides selling fruit and vegetables directly to get involved in these kinds of operations, for example, the French wholesale market uh, has made a joint venture with the Shanghai wholesale market, right? And you have the Australian wholesale markets investing in India to do joint ventures of wholesale operations, right? So these kinds of things are really big opportunities. Of course, it's a big part, 40% of the produce supply chain costs, and there's big growing pains, uh, but at the same time, you see really fast transformation. And some of these are transformations that are occurring, for example, by small and medium enterprises. I studied potato cold storages in Agra, in where you have the Taj Mahal in India. And everybody said, if you ask the people, they said, there's no cold storage in India, forget about it. I never believe anybody when I hear them, you know, some guru tells me that. I went out to the field, we did a big survey, and we found that the, the share of potatoes going through cold storages 15 years ago was 2%. Now it's 80% in that area. The biggest potato market in the world. Okay, that's the biggest potato market in the world. And so what happened is because you had the rise of the market of Delhi. If you think of the, you, when I flew into New York City, they see this is, I saw a poster that said, this is eight million people all using this or that. Okay, well, Delhi is a town that might be 18 to 25 million, depending on how you define it. And then the area right around Delhi might be another 15 to 20 million people. So it's like one big market, the size of France. Okay, so you think it's, it's it's like a country the size of France 
growing extremely quickly in incomes and all buying fruits and vegetables like mad. And so that's growing. The, the streets are getting, the uh, roads are getting better so you don't kill yourself going from the potato zone to Delhi. Electricity is going in. And then you have a lot of investments by local business people. So there was a huge investment in cold storages that went undetected. And that's why I give this talk, because a lot of times buyers and sellers from other places think that these places are not changing. But in fact, there's huge avalanches of changing occurring quickly because of combinations of things, incomes going up, urbanization, roads, uh, urb, uh, et cetera, uh, so that the market is changing. And there's very creative solutions that are taking place in Asia. For example, in the wholesale, wholesale sector, I was a, 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 a counselor, an advisor for the Wholesale Market Association of China. And so I got to see a lot of wholesale markets and was absolutely stunned. I would say that it's worth even going to China just to learn about what the wholesale markets are doing to learn to, for the US. Okay? And it was fascinating because, for example, the wholesale markets knew that the supermarkets were trying to start to source around them, okay, to get around them. They knew that they had to go for quality and diversity, set up networks among themselves, compete like regular businesses. And that's another thing. People always think China is communist and whatever it is, when in fact, I, I couldn't, I lived there for three years, couldn't detect any communism in terms of the economy, okay. Instead, it was the most private, liberal place I've ever seen. And the wholesale markets that maybe be half-half private public were actually vectors of change. They were setting up chains like McDonald's of wholesale markets, okay, for standardization. They were cr creating international trade networks among wholesale markets around Asia. They were also setting up supermarket chains that were owned by the wholesale markets. They were building modern segments, for example, specialized wholesalers within the wholesale markets. They're setting up, like you see in the, in the US, fresh cuts and processing centers within the wholesale markets. Cold storage is banana ripening. So I think that there's a huge opportunity of American businesses and Latin American businesses to enter into joint ventures as these wholesale sectors and logistics sectors change very quickly. So to wrap up, because I know, I don't know, how much time do I have? Okay, to, um, but I sort of, Actually, um, yes, I, I'll wrap up slowly because I have, uh, basically, yes, I'll, I'll wrap up with a scary story, okay? So I think that the key point I'm making is obviously that there's a gigantic opportunity in the Asian market. And it's not just for products, but it's also for entering into services. Uh, upstream services, midstream, downstream services. <coughs> and. Something that if you're a retailer, you've noticed is that, you know, I work with U.S. retailers buying produce, for example, from Chile or from other uh, Latin American uh, producers. And they'll say, well, we had a deal going, but suddenly the Chinese supermarkets swooped in and bought the deal away from me from Chile. So I was left empty handed. So, you know, that China and, and, and India more and more and certainly Thailand, et cetera, as competitors in the global fruit and vegetable scene as buyers is something that's emerging very quickly. But also, I think you have to take into account that with the growth of the buying side, the consumption side of fruit and vegetables, there's really a lot of Asian lions and tigers that are arising too that are very important in the supply scene, not just in Asia, but more and more globally. And so there'll be a challenge from Latin American and Asian suppliers to meet Asian demand. I'll never forget this example. When I was in a cold storage, you know, a cold storage distribution center in Indonesia that was for the Matahari supp uh, supermarket chain. And I'm not representing US produce or whatever, I just study the, the market. And I was walking along in the distribution center and I saw, uh, Chinese apple, Chinese apple, Chinese apple, Chinese apple. And so I said, just out of curiosity, and they, they had a little bit of Washington apple. I said, just out of curiosity, you know, I don't see very much U.S. apple here. I'm not representing U.S. apple, I'm just curious. And they said, oh, we're trying to eliminate U.S. apple from our holdings and most of the U.S. products. We only want red globe grapes from California. They seem to know how to compete. 
okay, I'll come back to Red Globe Grapes. And so I said, why is that? They said, well, five years ago, Chinese apples, I know I'm in a New York apple, you know, area and whatever, can be lynched, but five years ago, Chinese apples were lower quality but cheaper than U.S. apples. Now Chinese apples are equal or better quality than U.S. apples and cheaper. Okay, so that's a, you know, that plays into thinking about foreign direct investment by U.S. firms in Asia to supply to the Asian market. It also talks about how competitive the situation is. But then I went and gave this very talk that I'm giving now for Produce Marketing Association. I did it in Australia and uh, there were New Zealand people and Australians. And <clears throat> after I gave the talk, the buyer for Metro supermarkets in Asia stood up and said, you know, this is just a professor, you think he's full of shit because he's not a practical guy and whatever it is. This is real stuff that he's talking about in terms of the competition. And I can just tell you right now that there's only a couple people sitting in this audience, Enza and Zespri and a couple others he pointed to, that, are, that I really need, that I don't have to eliminate. On the other hand, just to illustrate Dr. Reardon's points, <clears throat> this group of people in the audience are your Red Globe grape producers. He told your story about Red Globe grape. These are the Red Globe grape guys from Australia. Right now I'm firing all of them. In the talk, he, he said, I'm delisting all of you. And they, you know, he's, I'm doing it partly because I was going to do it anyway and partly I'm going to illustrate his talk. And they, he said, because look at, six months ago, a delegation from China came into me with some Red Globe grapes and, you know, the, the boxing was really bad and the quality was more or less bad, but the price is 40% lower. And so I went back to my Australian guys who didn't really have any big defendable brand in my market and said, are you going to rock and roll? Can you meet their challenge? And they said, well, how, why do we need to? There's quality, there's cost on our, you know, there's quality on our side. So he goes back and he tells the Chinese, he said, if you can improve the quality to equal the Australian quality or better and safety and everything, but keep the price about 30% lower, you'll eat their lunch. They did it. Okay, they came back six months later with a perfect product and a, a cheaper product. Okay, so the issue of being nimble or having a major defendable brand within that market is now a real challenge and a, and a key point of a strategy. When you can just waltz in and say, here's New York apples or US apples or something and have the market. I also think, uh, and I put this in red because I'm quite nervous about this, that if you want to be competitive in the Asian market, it's probably not going to help enormously if trade restrictions are put on importing a product into the US because obviously there's going to be reciprocity and there'll be a lot tighter markets to export your, mar your product to the, those markets. Maybe if you're in a foreign direct investment joint venture with somebody, you might survive, but it's going to be harder and harder to get your product out to the world if things tighten up very much. I know a lot of people are nervous about that, but I wanted to end with the nervousness that competition causes as well as now possibly policy change causing, yet keeping in mind that there's this gigantic growing opportunity in the Asian market that it will be a huge opportunity for you to grasp. Thank you very much. Let's give Dr. Reardon a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Now we have time for questions. What questions do we have for Dr. Reardon? John? I'm, uh, John Pandel, I'm grape grower out of California. Great, John Pandel, I'm grape grower. Yes, yes. Okay, anyway. Um, the part about the wholesale developing, I mean, we've heard about the, the Asia copying Western retail formats, but do you see copies of CNS, Unified Grocers, co-ops like ShopRite, um, uh, kind of what do you, the associations like Topco, what do you see as kind of the, the model? What are, they, what are they copying in the wholesale sector? Or are they smaller? Yes. Um, I think that the main entry point that I've observed is the rise of these specialized, like uh, Xincheng, is like a company in Shanghai that works as a specialized, dedicated wholesaler that's buying in, 
aggregating product, maybe boxing. It, it's, it might be something like uh, Melissa's, uh, a little bit like the Melissa model is what I see coming up. Go, uh, Wing Mao in Hong Kong that would then play the same role of finding the product, making sure of uh, low seasonality, picking the quality, and then supplying the supermarkets. Whether there's going to be, you know, within China, whether the wholesale markets, I think what they want to do, which is the second thing, is the wholesale markets are forming networks and they're forming these kinds of associations where they want to be the go-to place and keep supermarkets from going around them by, by, be, by becoming essentially wholesale markets 2.0, you know, to be able to supply the supermarket chain. So those are the two things that I see. Whether the other things happen, I'm not sure. I think there'll be a lot of experiments in different ways that'll happen. Have you observed that? Yeah. I mean, as we get many of our successful ones, of course, are broadline, you know, produce and non-produce. Um, of course, in the U.S., we've seen from the the terminal markets to really off off-market wholesalers. The um, that's what uh, I mean by the right. specialized, dedicated they, wholesalers. They would be like off-market. They would be like, a, I don't know, a, a Four Seasons, a, a, a Jamara company, things like that that are not really market-driven but regionally driven. Exactly. That's precisely what I meant by the specialized, dedicated ones. They might, have, they might keep a foot in the wholesale market, uh, you know, and then they grow from the wholesale market. They set up their own distribution centers and warehouses outside of the wholesale market. This is the case of Xinjiang and Shanghai or, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so that they, they still are playing the wholesale market game, but at the same time, they're really shifting their services. And that's why the wholesale markets are also thinking about that and trying to go one step further and build specialized facilities so that you could say, instead of going completely off market, we'd like to take, take you under our wing and make this easy for you to do. A little bit like you'd see Maryland's uh, wholesale market with uh, fresh cuts and whatever. Any other questions? Well, I, I have a question for Dr. Reardon and then maybe we'll have another. Um, during your, our conversations and during your presentation, we talked a little bit about the geopolitical change that's forthcoming. You mentioned uh, the opportunity to do joint ventures as one way to penetrate the Asian market. Given those geopolitical uh, anticipated changes, do you think that's the safest play, the smartest play in the short run? Yeah, that's a good question because I think that if you probably, as time goes on, in many of the countries, if you don't have a local partner who's sort of vouching for you and working with you, uh, you might have a difficult time staying in the market. So uh, I think some, if possible to have some kind of diversified program would be good where you might be exporting some product directly in, growing some directly with the people there, um, you know, would be good politically, you know, to have the, the foot in the door and keep the foot in the door as things change. Because um, sometimes the situation is quite fluid. For example, China had for many years a block where um, you couldn't do foreign direct investment uh, into China's cities if you were a supermarket chain. But Carrefour came in and made specific deals with various cities, and then they you know, helped to build up the supply base locally and linkages there so that they were able to continue to, 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 to function even when the regulations weren't exactly in favor of that happening. And then when the regulations relaxed, they were already very present. So I think in the same way, you need to have some kind of diversified action where you have joint ventures going on as well as export operations. That's a good illustration. John, did you have another question? In the back of the room? Uh, appreciated your presentation. Uh, used to live in Michigan State, go Spartans. Uh, we found a lot of success in our industry in Japan. Uh, they pay well, the quality has to be good. But we're also trying to expand into China. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions, like any trade shows that might be a, might be a good uh, forte there? Yeah, I mean, definitely the Shanghai trade show would be a good step in. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, there's, I think there's probably a lot of Japanese firms that want to joint venture to sell 
into China, just like Singapore, plus U.S. firms or other firms joint venturing to set up operations in Shandong, so or Taiwan, you know, coming in, etc. So, I think that uh, sometimes there are stepping stones that you can do with joint ventures from the other places to penetrate in. Uh, yeah, the, the trade shows that I mentioned are a good idea, and then also going back to these off-market wholesalers. Wing Mao and Xin Cheng and these sort of companies are, I think, very useful intermediaries because they'll be able to introduce you into the market with their distribution uh, systems that are already present. There's also, as I said, because I was um, uh, like an advisor to the Wholesale Market Association, they have yearly meetings where you get to meet everybody from all the wholesale markets in in China, uh, and you know they they have they're, they're building trade shows there. And that's a fantastic opportunity because then, you know, the wholesale markets are still extremely important. So the trade shows are important, but also the wholesale sector is important. So those three, trade shows, wholesale market association, and then the regular food shows like the Shanghai show. And of course, the fruit logistica and uh, other kinds of, um, you know, Asia-wide ones that are occurring. Thank you, Dr. Reardon. Let's show them our appreciation. Okay, thank you.